Jay Har with the latest edition of Amazing Mets Alumni Conversation. We're pleasure to have the award-winning columns from the New York Post, Mike Vaccaro and Ed Lynch, former GM of the Cubs, former assistant GM of the Mets, former Mets player. Guys, we're here to talk about one of the most important days in Mets history coming up to the 40th anniversary of the trade for Keith Hernandez, June 15th, 1983. Before we start, I want to tell you how I screwed this up right from the kid. Go. When when when, uh, when Frank Cash had called me, he said, we've got a great player, Keith Hernandez, except one thing, he hates New York. He doesn't want to be here. Whatever you have to do to make it feel welcome, do it. So we're in Montreal. My, I come to the conclusion, let me get a big limousine. So I go to Montreal Airport, wait for Keith with my stretch limo, white limo. I went to the wrong gate. So, <laughs> so I went to the wrong gate. So I go back to the hotel in my limousine. Keith took a cab. I met him at the, at the ballpark that day, and I apologized. Thank you for me. My relationship with him has gotten better. <laughs> Mike, let me ask you this. I, I'm supposedly a historian with the Mets, and you know more about the Mets than I, than I do. Right the trade, with, you know, we have Gary Carter, Mike uh, Piazza, Lindor, Don Clendenin. How would you write the trade of Keith Hernandez with a Mets the organization? Yeah, I mean, to me, Jay, I mean, I, I think it has to be number one. Like, I mean, Clendenin's was huge because it was the, it was the kind of the final piece to make the miracle happen in 69. Um, but you know what? I mean, they were still an expansion team. So, I mean, it was, it, it, everything about that, 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 that team was feel good up until that point, even though they were losing so much. The difference was by 83, the Mets had become just a disaster, as you well know. In New York, I mean, it wasn't just that they were terrible, but they had the Yankees who had had a period of prosperity in, the, in their wake. So they had really reclaimed the town. And the Mets by 82, 83 were almost, you know, beside the point in New York. Now, Mets fans didn't believe that, but, I mean, there were fewer and fewer of us, I think, back in those days. I was still in high school. Uh, so it was, you know, we, we felt like a distinct minority in this town. And the fact is, I mean, I, I, I literally remember where I was when I heard the story. My, uh, another friend of mine who was a big Mets fan called me, and I thought he was pranking me because why in the world, how in the world would Keith Hernandez come to the, to the Mets? Why in the world would the Cardinals trade him anywhere, let alone the Mets? And I mean, I, I, I didn't believe him for like an hour. And finally, he was on the news and I, I, I was stunned, you know. And, and look, I mean, so that, that's from a fan standpoint, from a, from a baseball standpoint. You know, he was the first important piece. All due respect to Ed and the other guys who were already there. They were the team part that's of the okay. process. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean Shut up, Jay. He, 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 came, he, came, he came with gravitas. He came with, with, with an MVP award. He came with a World Series championship. And with a seriousness, you can even tell just from the stands that he, that he brought to the field every day. Um, and, and look, I mean, it wasn't like the Mets won right away that year. So you can't credit him for everything that came in the next couple of years. But he, but, but, but you, even as a fan, you can sense that, that, that something had changed. And I think because he was there, it allowed the Mets to be able to make a trade for someone like Gary Carter. You know, because the Mets became a, a destination place again and fairly quickly because of what you guys did in 84. And, you know, I mean, and you were part of that team and a huge part of that team. And. You know, that was probably the most, you know, it might be the most important team in Mets history, Jay. I mean, you were there. You might agree or disagree, but. I know, I agree. I, says that it turned to, I mean, there was just this, this, this onrushing momentum of, 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 of awful baseball for so many years, and 84 just reversed that tide. And I get it. There were other, I think there were other you know, parts later on, but, I mean, that was such an important year to kind of make the Mets relevant again. And I think part of that was the fact that Keith was a part of the team. And how, about, how was he received as a teammate then when, when, when you heard we got him? What was it? Remember what the reaction in the locker room was? Well, it was utter disbelief, frankly. I, I was like, why on earth would the defending world champion trade their best player to someone within the division? Uh, it just didn't make any sense to me. And and I and I said, well, who do we give up? And I, I expected half the guys in the clubhouse to go out the door. And, you know, Neil Allen was, it was a good major league pitcher. He was yeah. our closer. But certainly not up to Rick Ombi and and uh, and Neil Allen. You know, I said that's it. I mean, I, no insult to, to Neil Allen, but I think what Mike said, uh, the word he used, which was which is per- perfect, perfectly descriptive, is, is gravitas. He gave us some seriousness. He gave us seriousness about how we went about our job, seriousness about our purpose being there every day. He changed the whole culture of the organization, and not many players can can make that claim. So it was it was. Uh, 
you know, I remember we were in Montreal, as you said, and I remember sitting in the clubhouse in Montreal, looking across the clubhouse, and he was unpacking his stuff, and I'm thinking, boy, you poor son of a gun. I, <laughs> I hope you realize what you got yourself into, because this is my fourth year being on bad clubs in New York, and and I didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Now, we had Tom Seaver. Ironically, Tom pitched that night, the first night that Keith was in, in, uh, in Montreal with us, but other than that, I mean... Uh, Straw had just gotten there in May. I don't think Ronnie is there yet, but I mean, I think we all had a pretty good idea within the organization what kind of players we had in the minor leagues coming up. And I and I remember thinking, hey Keith, you know what? Don't be rash. Um, you know, wait till you see some of these guys we got coming. You might decide to stay. But you know, I, him and I were not. Uh, I hated him because I could, he was a very difficult guy to get out. Get him out, and, right? <laughs> you know, and and. Uh, then we became best of friends, almost like brothers. So uh, I think the word gravitas was a perfect description of what he brought to the organization. And, and, and didn't Seaver say, welcome to the stems? Yeah, yeah, it's, that's backwards. Yeah. That's backwards. Yeah, welcome yeah. to the stems. Mike, what was the first game you remember the first game you saw Keith play? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, honestly, I, I remember watching, you know, watching on TV the first time that he played. I don't know if it was the day he arrived the next day. And now that was either McCarver's first or second year in town, right? I mean, I mean he was early in his tenure, but it, it was his first. Yeah, it was his first, right? So I mean, I, 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 and he was already somebody that I'm like, wow, this. You know, even just McCarver's arrival, it's, it's it's funny how all these many different things on different levels kind of signal a difference with the Mets, right? And you know, it was, it was early in his tenure, but you already you, you already knew he was you know he was a smart guy to listen to and to to learn baseball from, and he was the guy who, you know, right away I remember saying, you know, take a look at what this guy does at first base. Look at how he. Look at how he does the small things, you know, and I'm not sure if the casual baseball fan necessarily would appreciate that, but somebody like me who was a rabid baseball fan, you know, talking about his footwork, talking about the way he played bunts, talking about the way he you know, was fearless throwing to another base, you know, which, which you don't get with a lot of even very good first baseball. So that's what I remember remember most, Jay. Um, uh, sadly, I think the first time I actually saw him in person would have been on the home opener in 84, and I think uh, – I'm pretty sure the score was ten nothing. Expo. It was on the road. We lost the. No, no, I, I mean the home opener in '84, and I think yeah. and you guys had actually, I think you lost that opener, but then you, you came home and you were like six and two or seven and one or something because you had a pretty good draw. Yeah. Faced, right. the, faced the Expos on opening day at home, and, and uh, Ronnie got lit up, and it was ten nothing. But I'm joking about that one <laughs> too. But 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 I also remember. I mean, we were there. You know, I we wanted to see Keith because he was. You know, we were a bunch of 16-year-old, you know, high school kids who wanted to who wanted to watch their team become good again, and we immediately we knew who. You know, I mean, I'm not sure. I, I don't know back in those days it was fashionable to to buy jerseys. So I don't know that we all bought our 17 jerseys quite yet. But I mean, we were certainly there to watch Keith and to watch what was obviously going to be a very exciting team. And, and so I do remember that part of it. Eddie Habeck, what was your first? Do you remember any early memories to get from Keith? Um. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, in the clubhouse in 83, I don't really remember him saying too much in 83. By the time he got there in June, our season was over already, you know, and uh, 68, 94. It's good. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we were this June 15th. We were already buried in last place. He didn't really say too much, but I, I, I vividly remember starting at day one of spring training in 84. It was like, hey, listen, losing is not acceptable anymore. I mean, up to that time. We would lose a close game and it'd be like, well, you know, the leaders on the club, the veterans would be like, hey, we tried hard and, you know, we came up short. Hey, where are we eating tonight? You know, <laughs> after that, it was not acceptable. It was like a personal insult to your family when we lost the game. And and I remember in 80, early in 84, I started out the year in the bullpen and I remember I came in and I had to get a bunt down in a game and I didn't get the bunt down. And boy, he was waiting for me on the top step. And he's like, what, are you, what the F are you doing? You got to get that down, you know? And I didn't really work that hard on my bunning up to then. But <clears throat> I remember thinking, now, who are you to tell me? But then it sunk in. It's like, hey, this is what leadership is all about, telling you things you don't want to hear at times, that things you need to do to win games. So I worked very hard on my my bunning with Bud Harrelson, and that's what leaders do. They they push you to be make yourself better. You see what's possible with guys like that. You know, you see the way he goes about his business and you want to be the same kind of guy. Mike, was he one of your go-to guys, you know, in later years? I mean, for your writing stuff. I mean, you know, was he sitting in front of his locker with a, with a can of Yoo-Hoo, you know, uh, digesting it, uh, you know, <laughs> celebrating the game? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Jamie, but believe it or not, I mean, sad as it is to say, I'm, 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 I'm too young to have, ever, to have ever covered him uh, as a player. 
But but uh, but 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 the answer to your question is yes, because later on he became one of my go-to guys in terms of, you know, when he was back working for the Mets, and by this time I was working at the Post. One of the first things I did when he came back to the Mets was introduce myself, and of course I gave him the whole background of how much you know. So 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 yeah, we, we became friends pretty quickly. I think I might have been the first person. Yeah, in fact, I know it was the first person that almost 20 years ago to say the Mets should retire at 17. So yeah, I got uh, he and I became certainly became uh, friendly after that one. Um, but he became my go-to guy in terms of, look, not only talking, you know, giving, giving a voice of authority, whatever I would write a historical piece about those teams in the eighties and what they meant to New York and what they meant to baseball. But he also became certainly, you know, in the early days of my, of my time at the post, when I was still kind of, you know, working my way around baseball and I, I never actually worked a baseball beat. You know, I, I came up through basketball, you know, before I got a column. And so, you know, he, he, he kind of became a, a teacher in some ways for me. I would just ask him questions, you know, if I see him, if I saw him in the dining room before a game or after a game or, you know, he, to me, he was a lot more useful to find, you know, you know, just basic information about, you know, the proper ways of doing things in baseball and even some of the guys who were managing the team at the time. Um, and he, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. So, 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 I mean, so, so the answer question is yes, although not as a beat writer. I mean, I know he was legendary among my colleagues. I mean, you know, obviously Clappish can go chapter and verse about how often he used Keith as a source uh, both on and off the record sometimes, um, you know, and, and, uh, and how useful he was. And not just in terms of getting a back page, but in terms of understanding the ins and outs of not only that team, but any team in the workings of a baseball team. And he had a friendship develop, you know, the, 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 the Rusty style eating place at the Ridge, you, Rusty, Ronnie, and Keith. I mean, how did that develop through the years? Well, I mean, a couple of things. Um, Number one, you know, we had uh, in 1984, I think we had like 18 single guys on the team. And uh, Keith and I and Rusty all lived in Manhattan. The other guys couldn't afford to live in Manhattan. And I was making good enough money where I could go out to dinner with Rusty and Keith, you know. So we had our dinners on Sunday night at Tokubai in Manhattan. That was our big thing. And uh, on the road, we go out and eat. And the other guys, these young guys, I mean, they were so much younger than the three of us. They didn't want to go out with three old guys, and they couldn't afford to go out and eat with us. So, I mean, the three of us became extremely close. And then after Rusty left, after the 85 season, you know, I was only there for half the year in 86. But Keith and our relationship just continued to evolve over the years. You know, when I went to law school and then I got in the front office, and I, like Mike said, I would call him and ask, you know, why did this guy do that in the game? And he always had an answer for me. So I think we're just alike. We're similar in age. We're, you know, he was a big Raiders fan. I was a Dolphin fan. He came down to Miami in the offseason to watch football, and we just had so much in common. So our friendship really did uh, grow over the years. Before I get to the next topic, I, top, I got to tell uh, my Rick Ownby story. It involves George Vesey. Rick Ownby's claim to fame was, he worked at his doorknob factory. So I saw the great George Vesey at the Times, a column on Rick Ownby making doorknobs. Yeah, before, about a month before we traded, he's never, ever let me forget it. Every time we sell me another Rick Ownby story, I mean, he, was, he was a big blonde head guy, you know, uh, and he, he made doorknobs. I mean, you know, me, me and my wolf set the humor. That was a perfect article for me. <laughs> That's great. That's like the, yeah, that's like the second best off the field Mets profession ever behind Richie Hebner and being a... Uh... Yes, oh, yes, a, yes. A grave digger, right? <laughs> yeah. I want to talk Hall of Fame if we can. Uh, so, five All Star teams, uh, two Silver Sluggers, 17 years, 296 batting average, over 2,000 hits, over 1,000 RBIs, uh, NB, World, World Series MVP, two um, uh, World Series championships. Why, why is it, you know, like he couldn't even get on the ballot? for the contemporary committee last time, and he's not eligible again to 225. You know, I, I've been around not as much as you guys, but you need an advocate in these things. Like, with, no offense to Harold Baines, but Harold Baines got in a couple of years ago. He had a couple of advocates on a committee. It took, it took Gil Hodges 35 votes before Joe Torrey was able to get the story straight, and he got in. Does he, Keith have any hope? He's not eligible to 2025 again. What's your guys feeling on that? Well, I mean, look, I mean, uh, at the start, I'll say I, I, I had the opportunity to vote for him five times when I first got a Hall of Fame vote. I voted for him all five times. Again, I never covered him. So, I mean, that's pretty, and that's part of the weirdness of the voting bodies. A lot of times you have guys who are voting for guys they never covered or, or went around, you know. It's an, it's an ever-shifting voting body when it comes to the baseball writers portion of the Hall of Fame ballot. But, um, 
I think he does have a shot. And I, and I was actually stunned that he wasn't on um, this, the, 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 the ballot just passed, only because Mattingly was. And usually when you, when, when you discuss one's candidacy, you automatically discuss the others because they're so t- closely entwined, not only as contemporaries, but also as guys who would be the definition of borderline Hall of Famers, although I would argue that both are on the proper side of that border. Um, look, I mean, I, I, and, and I think I think once he gets on the com, on, on, on the committee ballot, which he will eventually, I think he's got a good chance for two reasons. One, because I think those people are less married, you know, those voters are less married to, uh, uh, you know, to to, 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 to to modern stat work, you know. And even in those, even with that, Keith does very well. Even with modern advanced analytics, he does pretty well. I mean, it's just it's just that when he was playing, that wasn't anything that anybody really thought about. But in, that let him go gloves too. I do feel like and, that, of course, and of course, and I think anybody with, who, with, with any kind of sense of of the game in the years he played, you know, between 1977 and 1990 around there, understands that he was definitely one of the best players in the game that year. I think that's going to matter. I also think, and this is, you know, I mean, this is probably damning with same with faint praise, but look, if I mean, you mentioned Harold Baines, but I mean, to me, if, you know, Ted Simmons is a Hall of Famer. Ted Simmons was an excellent baseball player. Simmons was also a longtime Cardinal, so there's a real comparison there. And I mean, I, I mean, I don't know a Cardinals fan that I alive who would tell me that 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 Simmons was a better player than Keith Hernandez. And I think that stuff matters. Once you have precedence for players who get in, like Baines and like Ted Simmons, I, I think that's going to help Keith's case once he gets on the ballot. I, I still have no understanding why he wasn't on this last ballot. I mean, you know, did, Madeline didn't get on, so he might not have gotten in. But I mean, it, it, you still need to have an opportunity to vote for this guy. I, hey, what's your view? I'm sorry. Well, you know, if you look at the, the, the three or four important things, defense, offense, um, leadership, and how, as Mike said, how he compares to other Hall of Famers. Now, if you look at his 11 gold gloves, that's only matched by four other guys in the history of baseball. Brooks Robinson, Ozzie Smith, Roberto Clemente, and Willie Mays. That's a pretty good group, and he's not in the Hall of Fame. Um, except for Keith, the all-time gold glove winners at every position on the field is in the Hall of Fame except him. And then the other part of it on the, as you said, the awards, uh, but durability. I can tell you, this guy played every day. During that tw- the, the 12 year span, 1976 to 1987, he played more games than Mike Schmidt, Dave Winfield, and Jim Rice. You know, he was a cornerstone of two World Series champions. He's got it, he's in the Hall of Fame of two different franchises. How many guys can say that? And as Mike said, you know, he does okay with the analytics, you know. Um, of all the Gold Glove leading Hall of Fame infielders, Keith is second in batting average, number one in OPS, and number one in OPS plus. And as Mike said, Ted Simmons had the quote where analytics got me into the Hall of Fame, and he 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 um, he cited two different categories of that on base percentage and WAR. And if anybody ever figure out figures out what WAR means, please tell me. But um, you know, Keith beats him in both of those. So I mean, there's precedent, there's comparison. I've talked about the intangibles, but the tangibles are there also. So, um, you know, I just hope that people look at this dispassionately and passionately because I think he ranks up there in both of those uh, categories. And there's, okay. there's just two other things I want to add too. Just I mean, and again, I mean, these are just things that, that are add-ons to his to, to, to his candidacy and to his campaign. You know, one, I mean, the man played two Game Seven of the World Series in his life, and had probably the biggest hit in both of those games. You know, right. for two different teams. You know, and I think one of the reasons why Mets fans love him is there's an image that's unforgettable for Mets fans of that era of him in game seven, getting that big hit that ties the game. I think it tied the game, right? It was, or he broke the ice. One, it was a huge game. It was a huge hit. And just, it, it, when he gets to, to, to the second base, he's like, and also he had a big hit. He had a huge hit in game six against the Astros, too. So these all things, need. I think they need to be a factor. Also, look, I mean, bad timing, bad luck, what have you. I mean, he really – could have you can make a serious argument that he should have won the MVP in '84. Ryan Sandberg had a great year, so he was definitely a worthy winner. But now, if you're talking about a two-time MVP, how do you keep that guy out of the Hall of Fame? And he didn't miss out winning that MVP by that much. And as a guy who probably watched 140 of those games of your games that year, Ed, I can tell you, I've never seen a guy more valuable to a team than that guy was in 1984. You know, oh, when I go back to '86, Eddie, in the seventh in Game Six against Houston. When Jesse Orozco struggled on the mound, you know, Keith goes to the mound, probably the greatest pitcher confrontation on the mound. And he says to Jesse, if you throw, if you, if you throw another fastball, I'll kill you. And that was what he did all the time. There might have been another you know? word in there, right? 
Yes, <laughs> you know, you know, in other words, let I me, mean, in honesty, we know Keith has some troubles off the field. As I, unless some, uh, you know, nobody's perfect. Yeah. Do you think that fact is into it at all? I mean, what do you, what's your gut with that? I sometimes wonder that, but look, I mean, I mean, for better or for worse, we tend to give guys who have had uh, substance abuse problems far more of a pass than we give guys who decided to use steroids. That's fact, because there are guys who, you know, spent time, you know, in, in rehab or publicly battling their substance abuse demons who are in the Hall of Fame. Maybe they had to wait a little extra. Maybe, you know, I mean, look, I mean, I, I won't name them just to embarrass them. But we all know who they are. And this, and it wasn't it wasn't a secret. That's just they're they in the Hall. It was a different standard. So, I mean, I, I think that might have been a reason why, you know, and sometimes voters hold back because of certain reasons. So they won't vote them on the first time or the, or the third time. I don't think that's the deciding factor for a lot of guys. I can't. I mean, like, I mean, I, I know he was maybe his was more public than others, but I mean, I, I think that that he served a long and meritorious penance after the Pittsburgh trials, and clearly never, you know, you know, was was never anywhere near trouble again from that standpoint. So I, in my, my experience, guys, with 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 Gil Hodges, having a champion on on a committee means so much. Not to bore you, so uh, uh, Ferguson Jenkins was on a committee. I, we had Cleon Jones call Ferguson Jenkins to talk, to talk about Gil. And it just it, it, it just meant play so much of an important thing. Who's, you know, who's voting? You know, you got to get 12 or 16 votes. And and this ballot is, is really stacked to contemporary ballot. I mean, we suppose the other guys left off. But do so you really guys think that, that and it's 2025? I think it's 2025, I wrote down. I think you're right. I think it's every three is, years. That, that he's... Got it. Time will make it better for him, not worse. Well, I, I think you know. I had lunch with Josh Rawish, the president of the Hall of Fame, about a right. month ago, and uh, and we talked. We went through all of this, and we talked about some other players. I said, "Why is this not? I'm not going to bring any names up, but why isn't this guy in the Hall of Fame? Why isn't that guy in the Hall of Fame?" And he said, "Well, they had some off-field things, and some of the things were pretty heinous stuff. You know, I'm talking about you know domestic battery yes, things of that nature. Yeah. You know, and you know." Keith has served his time. He served his time. And this we're talking about almost 40 years ago. And and his life since then has been pristine and uh, perfect in my, on and off the field. And, um, you know, I never saw any of that stuff that came up in the Pittsburgh drug trial. When he came to New York, he was ready to play every day. Never saw any hint of any kind of substance abuse. Nothing. Zero. And we're talking almost 40 years ago. So, well, actually 40 years ago. So... Um, we ask guys to be accountable all the time, right? I mean, yeah, it's more accountable right. than, than raising your right hand and swearing under oath that you were a drug addict at one point. I mean, he did that. That's right. I mean, so, so I mean, he, he stood up and he, he owned it. He acknowledged it. And for, as Ed said, for the last 40 years, you know, he's, 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 he's you know, essentially the, lived. The, the night before he left for go to Pittsburgh, I think he got four hits. And we were in San Diego and he got four hits. that night. Four. And... And when he came back, he said, listen, I want to do this the right way. We, we put all the writers up to Arthur Richmond's suite. And and he said, I did what I did. And he he he, he, he spilled the beans. He said, I did it. And, you know, but I, I just, I mean, look, if anybody see this guy play, there's nobody better on and off the field. And, you know, Davey Johnson trusted implicitly with his team. He made him the first Mets captain. And hopefully... In a couple of years, he'll get his, his rightful due. I, mean, I think there's. I mean, I, I think. I, mean, I, I think it's fair to say, if he wasn't the best defensive first baseman who ever lived, he's in the top two or three. I think that's fair. And oh, that's more than fair. I yes. mean, I, mean I, I happen to think. You know, now I, I, you know, I, I didn't see a George Sisler play, but I mean, you know, I, I, <laughs> I you know, I, I happen to think that 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 should count for some. Bill Mazeroski is in the Hall of Fame. Yes, he had a famous home run, but he's in the Hall of Fame because he was acknowledged as the best defensive second baseman of all time to that point. And so if that's going to be a standard, especially among the Veterans Committee who voted Mazeroski in, then being the best first defensive first baseman of all time ought to matter in Keith's win column there. And you know what? You can agree. Keith doesn't get paid. Listen, he wants it. You know, we, but he doesn't go blatantly, I should be in the Hall of Fame. He, you know, whatever happens, he's not an ego guy at all. You know, he, he, he listen, I hope it gets it to you. Listen, you guys are both busy. I want to thank you very much, Mike Kennedy, for your time. And I hope to see you guys, too. Thank you for doing this. And, and, you know, happy anniversary to Keith on June 15th, 1983. Thanks, Jay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jay. Thank you for your time, guys. I really appreciate it.